Um, welcome to the Leicestershire Archaeological Society lecture. Um, this evening our speaker is Professor Andrew Brees of the University of Navarre, Pamplona. He has written several books on medieval subjects and a chapter of his latest, British Battles 493 to 937, discusses the documentary evidence for the real King Arthur, a 6th century North British hero. Um, during the lecture, if you've got any questions for our speaker, can you please type them into the chat box and I will do my best to pass them on. Um, and I will now hand you over to our speaker who can enlighten us all about the real King Arthur. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. Um, the first thing I want to say is rather topical. Um, I think almost everybody will know about the news that we had at the beginning of the week um, uh, from scientists in London who've done extraordinary work on protein. Uh, they've uh, analyzed ex incredibly complex patterns and they've been using algorithms and computers and something called deep thought and so on. And they deserve credit. Uh, but what I want to say, first of all, to everybody, all the people out there from Vanuatu and Glasgow and Wales and beyond and so on, is uh, what I did is something that any of those out there could have done. It really is very simple, the business of um, identifying uh, the real uh, Arthur, uh, the real warrior Arthur. All you need is uh, four or five books um, and perhaps a certain knowledge of the Celtic languages and away you go. Uh, so in this talk, I'll be talking about the problem I'll be talking about the evidence for the real Arthur. I'll be showing some pictures. Uh, I'll go through to um, what we can know about Arthur. Uh, I think more than most people imagine, we can say various things about him, uh, and particularly that he existed. He's not uh, an imaginary uh, entity like Father Christmas or Robin Hood or Jack uh, Frost and so on. He is a historical person despite what has been claimed for more than 40 years by many professional historians. And just to give us something uh, nice at the end, a sort of lollipop, as uh, Sir Thomas Beecham said about uh, the fine light in his uh, concerts, I'd like to show uh, a monument from Scotland which is perhaps the nearest thing we can show to something that Arthur might himself uh, have seen. Uh, a genuine historical relic from the age of Arthur, that is from North Britain in the earlier 6th century. Right, so having said that, I'd like to go on to the evidence and particularly to a couple of maps, which I have thanks to uh, Tim Clarkson of Manchester. He's expert with the technology and so it was he who plotted those maps for the benefit of the book British Battles 493, 937 and some. Right, so what can I say? Um, item A, uh, the piece of evidence A, as in a law court, is like something from a good mystery novel, a certain ancient manuscript. And this manuscript is in the British Library, in the Harley Collection, and it uh, dates from about the year 1100. Uh, it contains genealogies, and particularly it contains the text Historia Britonum, the history of the Britons. And it's notorious chapter 56, with its obscure list of Arthur's 12 battles. Well now I've got hold of uh, an image from the British Library collections and so people I think can see it and indeed it's coming up fairly clearly and about halfway down on the left uh, there's a sort of little dent where the scribe forgot to fill in uh, the letter, a capital letter T, a coloured T, but there should be a T there and if we put that T in then we can read Tunc Arthur Pugnabat um, contra Ilos uh, in Ilis Diebus cum regibus, uh, what is it, cum reginus Britannorum, sed ipse dux erat 
Berlorum. He was the Dux Berlorum. He was the captain of battles, the leader of battles. And then after that, we have these notorious 12 batters, Primum, Bellum, Fuit, and all the rest of it and so on. Right, well at this point, I give up the pretense that I can read uh, medi a medieval Latin script, uh, the way that uh, we read our morning newspaper, and I reach for the crib in front of me, which is the uh, translation by John Morris, uh, published in 1980. Now, uh, I, I say to everybody straight away, don't worry too much, we're not going to go into minute philological detail on those 12 battles, but I would like to read his translation. The first battle was at the mouth of the River Court Glen. The second, the third, the fourth and the fifth were on another river called the Douglas, which is in the county of Lindsay. Well, that's the way that, that's the way that uh, Morris translates it. And if we accepted that, that will put it in Lincolnshire. But I think that's wrong. I think there's a mistake in the text. I think that Linuis uh, in the original Latin text is an error for Cludwis and so on, that we should be looking at the Clyde. I hope this will become a bit clearer later on. The sixth battle was on the river called Bassas, which nobody's ever been able to find. The seventh battle was in Kelethan Forest, that is the battle of Kelethan Coid and so on, the uh, of Caloven Wood. Well, everyone agrees that one's pretty clear. Uh, Caloven is Welsh, is old Welsh for Caledonia, so that definitely puts us in North Britain. The eighth battle was in Gwynion Fort, and then we get a bit of detail about how Arthur carried the image of the Blessed Virgin and put the heathen to flight, and so on and so forth. The ninth battle, we are told, was in the city of the Legion. The tenth battle was fought on the bank of the river called Trafroid. The eleventh battle was on the hill called Agnev. And the twelfth battle was on Baden Hill, and in it 960 men fell in one day from a single charge of Arthur's. And no one laid them low save he alone, and he was victorious in all his campaigns. So this is stirring stuff. Now, this list of battles has been... I would like to think perhaps the biggest problem in British historiography, that scholars have been puzzling over it for 500 years. And even Sir Winston Churchill, who was very interested in Arthur and is devoted several pages to him in his history of the English speaking peoples, even he could say no more on it than this list of obscure battles in unlocated Places. It's been one of the great mysteries of British historiography where these battles were uh, and when they were fought. And so now, uh, rather like a magician pulling out something from a hat, I would like uh, Matthew to go on to the next picture. There we are, Britain. And it will be evident, I think, that you can see a cluster of black dots around southern Scotland but stretching into Wendy's county of Cumberland and another one in uh, Northumberland. Don't worry we'll see those in more detail uh, in a few seconds from now and so on. Please note uh, this uh, cluster of battles in what is now the southern uplands of Scotland and one odd man out as it were, um, a freak, an exception, Right down in Wiltshire, another black dot. Oh, well done. Uh, excellent. My goodness, the, 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 out, the high technology is being put to good use here. And this is the Battle of Baden Hill, which Historia Britonum gives as Arthur's last and greatest battle. But I say, no, it ain't so. The Battle of Baden Hill certainly took place. We can even date it. Uh, to 493 and some, but it is nothing whatever to do with Arthur. Right, now if we can go on to map, uh, the next map, the second map, this should make things a bit clearer. Yes, now this is Tim Clarkson in action and so on. Without going into uh, a vast amount of detail, um, what we have to be concerned with uh, in this list of mysterious places 
is the possibility of scribal corruption. Um, medieval scribes misspelt things, misunderstood things, distorted things, just the way any of us could, particularly when grappling with place names in a language that is not uh, familiar to us and so on. Um, and therefore, when I published the original paper on Arthur, uh, I felt that some of the names could be taken straight, but others needed a bit of tweaking, uh, a bit of textual emendation. And once one starts doing that, a pattern starts to form that all these battles, except for the Battle of Baden Hill, of which we'll have more in a few moments, can be located in this particular area of North Britain, as the historians call it, um, the part of what is now Scotland, south of the Clyde Fourth Line, south of the Gaelic realm of Dolreatha, out there in the West Highlands, or of Pictland to the north of the uh, Fourth Estuary and so on. So these are the North Britons. Uh, they spoke a language, Cumbric, which was very similar to Welsh. It became extinct about the year 1100, but they've left behind a whole string of place names which can be located and in most cases given meaning. Well now, uh, observant people have noticed that some of those uh, battles mentioned uh, appear here. Over on the right, we can see the River Glen in what is now Northumberland. This uh, location has been accepted for a long time. Uh, we can also see in the middle of the Southern Uplands, there's Caloven. Uh, this will be not far from uh, the, uh, not far from Moffat, where Robin uh, Crichton is endeavouring to arrange uh, a conference on uh, Merlin, despite the difficulties of the present time. Uh, not too far from uh, where the road and the railway climb up to Betwick, so in the very heart of the southern uplands and so on. Uh, and then we have some that are slightly more difficult. For example, those four battles on the River Douglas. Well, people like uh, Leslie Olcott in his very well-known uh, Penguin book, uh, Arthur's Britain, uh, tended to locate it in Lincolnshire, taking this reference Linwis as one to Lindsay and so on. But there is a giant problem, that there is no River Douglas in Lincolnshire, but there is one in the former county of Lanarkshire in Scotland. So we have a contradiction. What are we going to do? And in my paper in Northern History for 2015, I argued that if we tweak Linwis and write Clidwis, it will mean the people living on the Clyde and the Douglas is a tributary of the Clyde. In other words, we can locate uh, four more battles just like that in what is now southern Scotland. Now, as I say, I don't want to go into too much detail on these. Uh, that city of the Legion, um, there again, I think we've got an error. There's a wonderful book by W.J. Watson, who was a great scholar. He was professor of Celtic at Edinburgh University in the 1920s and 30s, and he wrote a classic volume, the, the History of the Celtic Place Names of Scotland. It came out in 1926, but it is still an indispensable tool for the investigation of the place names of Scotland and indeed beyond Scotland. He was a very great scholar. And he mentions a place, Carig Legion, the rock, the cliff of the legion, right at the east end of the Antonine Wall. And I think it's fairly easy to see what has happened, that the battle, the uh, one of the 12 battles of Arthur, took place at Caliglegion in North Britain, but a Welsh scribe centuries on knew nothing of this obscure place and therefore wrote a version of Caer Leon, which is interpreted by some as Chester, uh, in the Northwest Midlands and others by Carleon in Southeast Wales. In other words, he went for the easier reading, but the fallacious one, an obscure place was lost and substituted by a much better one, which however, makes no historical sense. Let me deal with the other names quickly and so on. Uh, you'll see there's two places, uh, there are two places called Gwynion. Uh, ignore the one at the bottom. This is a mistake by Andrew Breeze. Um, 
it was Tim Clarkson who suggested Carwinde, right over on the left in North Ayrshire. He thought that was much more likely to be the fortress of Gwynion mentioned in the text, so he is right and I was wrong, so please ignore the southern place, Kirk Winion, which I think has nothing whatever to do with Arthur and so on. Uh, Taras, again you see two places, I'm afraid it's not possible to decide whether we have a location uh, not far from the border on the River Tars, or whether uh, we are dealing with the River Taras near Carstairs. Carstairs, the railway junction, uh, where some trains go to Edinburgh and some trains go to uh, uh, Glasgow and so on. One of those two places, uh, I don't think it's possible at the moment to say which. Trafrawid is mentioned uh, in an early Welsh poem, as well as in uh, Historia Britonum. It's mentioned in the context of Lothian, and I think that can be taken as Drava on the River Tweed. Uh, Agwedd, I believe, is a lost place named not too far from Howick. Uh, and then we are left with two names uh, that are not actually mentioned in Historia Bretonum. One of the late texts talks of um, the Battle of Agned or Agwed as being near Brewin. And Kenneth Jackson, who was another great scholar, a very great scholar, professor of Celtic at Edinburgh from 1950 to 1979, he saw this as the uh, representing the Roman fortress of Bremenian, where a river roars loudly and so on, which is known on the present day maps as High Rochester and so again in uh, Northumberland. Uh, he's not saying that Arthur fought a battle there, but the Welsh scribe had an idea that Agned or Agwed was not far from High Rochester. This is important evidence for Arthur as a northern warrior uh, and not a Welshman and not a Cornishman. Okay, let us come to an end. Camlan, which is not mentioned in Historia Bretonum, but is mentioned in the Welsh Annals. The Welsh Annals say in the year 537, Arthur fell at Camlan. Again, uh, an archaeologist, O.G.S. Crawford, in 1935, identified this as Cambor Glana, a fort on Hadrian's Wall, uh, now uh, known as Castlesteads. Again, this puts Arthur in North Britain. And as for, uh, as for the Battle of um, as for the Battle of Baden Hill right down there in Wiltshire, well I want to say this is, this is certainly a great British victory. Uh, we can date it to 493, but it is nothing whatever to do with Arthur. Arthur will have died in 537. Uh, it's impossible to make him out as taking part in the great British victory of 493. The dates just don't fit. So, once we've plotted these places on the map, we start to see something resembling the face of the real Arthur, the historical Arthur. He will have had nothing to do with Wales or Cornwall. He will have been a North Briton nor would he have been fighting the English. Um, when Historia Britonum was written, uh, it's put in the context of um, what somebody took, what Collingwood, the Roman uh, historian, took as uh, uh, a captain of cavalry, uh, a uh, generalissimo moving up and down England to fight the English. This is nonsense, it's nothing to do with the English. The evidence suggests and I'm going to come up to volcanoes in a minute, the evidence suggests that there was indeed a great British victory at Baden Hill, which I think can be located as a hill fort by Braden Forest in Wiltshire. I think the manuscripts have got Baden wrong, one letter, R has dropped out. Mons Badonicus can be restored as Mons Bradonicus, and it can be identified as Braden in Wiltshire, and presumably the West Saxons were there trying to capture Cirencester, capital of the Britons, in the year 493, and they were knocked for six. And the Britons never forgot about their great victory, but nothing to do with Arthur, who is operating more than 40 years later at the other end of the country. Okay, let us go on. Arthur was not a king. 
so if people come along asking about Camelot and the round table and the Knights of the Round Table and all the rest of it, I'd say, forget that. He wasn't a king. The early sources are quite uh, secure on that. Uh, no mention of kingship. The title given to him is Dux Bellorum, and I think that can be identified in Welsh terms as Pentaili, the captain of the royal host, the captain of the uh, king's particular bodyguard. And this was an important position. Uh, the king certainly didn't give it to anybody he didn't trust and so on. And so we have Arthur not as a king, but as a warrior. And now we come on to the volcanoes. Now we have people from Vanuatu and Brazil. Uh, I think we are not likely to have anybody from El Salvador, but anybody who knows El Salvador will know that near the capital, near San Salvador, is a gigantic hole in the ground. It's something like 10 miles long, and it has a lake, um, um, if I remember rightly, the name is Ipalgado, and so on, and it is the hole left after a mega eruption in the year 535. Now, the, the climatologists and the volcanologists uh, are doing a lot of research on this. They're boring cores away through the ice of Greenland, trying to find volcanic dust. But there's very good reason to think that in the years 536 to 537, the Northern Hemisphere underwent what climatologists call a volcanic winter, a terrible disaster. Uh, we actually have a reference from um, a Byzantine historian, Procopius. Procopius was in Sicily in March 536, and he noted how the sun was dimmed. He said it appeared as if it was in eclipse or as if it was like the moon. And what was happening was something like 10 cubic um, ki kilometers of dust and sulfur and earth and rock was going up into the stratosphere, was blotting out the sun and was bringing, first of all, uh, a chill to the northern hemisphere and then crop failure. And we can confirm this because the Welsh annals in the same year, 537, that they mention the death of Arthur at Camlan, uh, this fort on Hadrian's Wall, nothing to do with Wales, I think we can be quite sure, they also speak of a terrible mortalitas, um, a great uh, disaster occurring to the British people. The evidence of the volcanologists suggests this was a famine, and it was a famine brought about by a volcanic winter. And we have references to famine in Irish annals at the same time, I believe even in records from China, this terrible disaster, perhaps the most terrible disaster ever to occur to the peoples of Britain and Ireland in post-Roman times. And I think the battles of Arthur can be fitted rather neatly into this. What he was doing, uh, to put it bluntly, was not fighting for territory uh, or for gold. He was raiding his British neighbours in North Britain for cattle. He was on the time-honoured Celtic pursuit of cattle raiding. If there's anybody listening from Ireland, they will know that the great saga of early Irish literature is Tonbal Fulini, the cattle raid of Cooley, describing a, an epic uh, pursuit of monstrous creatures and so on, in which it seems practically the whole of Ireland seems to be taking part. And there are plenty of references to uh, cattle, uh, uh, cattle rustling, raiding your neighbour and taking away his cattle in early Welsh poetry, including some poetry from North Britain, poems attributed to the Bard Taliesin, writing in the 590s or so. So we're in a time of terrible famine. What I propose Arthur was doing was uh, raiding his Celtic neighbours, his British neighbours, the Godovan, who occupied uh, Lothian, 
and the east coast going down into what is now Northumberland, uh, Northum uh, Northumberland and also the people of Hreged, uh, that is the people with their capital on the Upper Eden, uh, on the border of the former Cumberland and Westmoreland, that he was not fighting the English who were nowhere near North Britain in the year 536, 537. He was raiding his neighbors and he was taking their cattle and he was bringing the cattle back to Strathclyde. I think Strathclyde is the only place that makes sense in this context. And he was rescuing the people of Strathclyde from famine. I think this is the uh, series of events which put these battles into a context. Um, so Arthur is first of all a hero and within a few decades of his death, a soldier's death at Camlin in the year 537, he is a legend to the people of Strathclyde. And the evidence for the early sources, the Latin ones in Historia Britonum, and then, of course, the first native story of Arthur, uh, the story of Kiloch and Olwen, which is from the Mabinogion, which we can date pretty securely to the late 1090s, just at the very end of the 11th century. Uh, these show how the warrior of history has become a tremendous chieftain of legend. It is a North British legend which travels down to Wales and indeed even to Cornwall. There are traditions of him. And then in the early 12th century, 1136 or so, the uh, Anglo-Norman or Cambro-Norman cleric Geoffrey of Monmouth, he publishes his best-selling history of the kings of Britain and it is him uh, it is to him that we owe the traditions of Arthur as a great chivalrous king with his capital at Caerleon in southeast Wales and so on. It's Geoffrey of Monmouth who gets the Arthurian show on the road and to that all the wonderful stories of medieval tradition, uh, what we read in Geoffrey of Monmouth, what we read in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight in the 14th century, Mallory in the 15th century, and then we go on to, to Tennyson, the idols of the king, and indeed uh, to the modern versions that are made, which Hollywood so much loves. The story of Arthur begins in Strathclyde, but it now goes on to the whole wide world, to Hollywood and beyond, even to Vanuatu. People know about Arthur, people love the wonderful stories of Arthur, this inexhaustible treasure which the British people have given to the peoples of the world. So that's my spiel on Arthur. So I like to bring that part of it to a conclusion. What can we know about Arthur? Well, he existed. Uh, he was killed in the year 537. He was killed in what is now North Cumbria, Northern Cumberland, on Hadrian's Wall. Uh, nothing to do with Wales, nothing to do with Tintagel, all those stories from Cornwall, which are such good news for the Cornish tourist trade. I'm all in favour of people going to Tintagel, but uh, Arthur is nothing to do with Cornwall, nothing to do with Wales. He can be securely located in North Britain. And uh, I say that for the benefit of Carol Huff, whose picture has just appeared, and so on, that I'm doing my bit for her part of the world, and so on. Indeed, um, it's even been suggested that when he brought those cattle home, that Arthur would have come to govern, or certainly somewhere in the vicinity of Glasgow. A few other things. He would have spoken British, uh, a Celtic language, uh, which has given us modern Welsh, Cornish and Breton. He himself had a lame of Latin origin. When we come to our inscription in a minute or two, we'll see more of Latinity in that part of the world. Artorius uh, gives modern Welsh Arthur and so on. Uh, his name is not Celtic, it is of Latin origin. And he himself not only would have spoken British, he would have spoken Latin. The people of his part of the world were very proud of their connections with the Roman Empire and of their Latin heritage. So, 
a warrior, a supremely successful raider, somebody who became a hero to his own people in a time of crisis, uh, somebody with a Latin age, uh, with a Latin name, uh, he would have been a Christian, he possibly even thought of himself as a Roman, but he might have looked rather different from the, the caricatures of uh, Roman uh, officers, you know, John Cleese in uh, The Life of Bra Brian, one of those silly helmets with a sort of furry thing on top and so on, that perhaps come to the mind of some of us when we think of uh, military command in this period. Right, well, having shown the map and so on, uh, I'd like to go on to the, the lollipop at the end, uh, because people might say, well, uh, you talk about these places, you uh, talk about uh, southern Scotland, you talk about North Britain and so on. Uh, is there anything you could actually show us, uh, something tangible that we could associate with the age of Arthur? So if you could now have that nice picture of that uh, monolith in a bleak landscape, this is the Yarrow Stone uh, in the former Selkirkshire. Uh, it was discussed on various occasions by Kenneth Jackson, the great scholar whom I've already mentioned, and he and uh, uh, his colleagues were the first people to give a definitive translation of the inscription on this stone. I understand that it turned up in the early 19th century, uh, it was moved, it was erected on its present site, but the meaning of its inscription, which some have endeavoured to associate with Arthur, and indeed, I read a very entertaining thing on the web, somebody was claiming that this is the very grave of Arthur himself, uh, which I don't believe, uh, although I think he was buried, I feel sure he was buried somewhere in what is now southern uh, Scotland and some. So there's the stone in an appropriately uh, impressive uh, Scottish landscape, plenty of fresh air. And if we could now go on to the inscription itself, which Wendy says is very familiar to her, uh, I'm going to reach for my crib, I'm going to reach for a lecture by Kenneth Jackson, a classic lecture uh, published in the early 1960s on Angles and Britons in Northumbria and Cumbria. Uh, he actually draws attention to this inscription. It's very difficult to read, but with his knowledge of the Celtic languages, he was able to interpret it. And he gives a transcription. I'm reading the transcription. Uh, Hic memoria perpetuor in loco insignissime principes nudi dum no geni hic jacent in tumulo duo filii liberale. And he provides a convenient translation. This is the eternal memorial. In this place lie the most illustrious princes, nudos and dumno genus. Here lie in the grave the two sons of liberalis. And Jackson comments that liberalis is a very good Latin name, as indeed uh, the name Arthur is Artorius, another good Latin name, but just showing the blend of languages and cultures that we have in the North Britain of this day. Uh, the other two names are Celtic, the first is the same as Welsh Neath and so on, and Jackson is quite specific, nothing is known of these people, but they must have been uh, chiefs of the central border country at that time. And he dated the inscription to the early 6th century. Uh, in another of his uh, lectures on the Britons in southern Scotland, which came out in Antiquity for 1955, he gives a wonderfully clear account of the history of southern Scotland between the fall of Rome and the coming of the Normans, and he makes the comment that for the early 6th century our sources are few indeed, uh, almost nothing but a series of early Christian inscriptions from this part of the world. What information can we extract from them? Well, we can see that the people of that time uh, wrote in Latin, uh, they wrote in Roman script, uh, they were even proud to give themselves 
uh, Latin names. We know of others called uh, Tacitus, Tacitus, or, uh, Dun or uh, Donatus, and so on. Um, it was felt to be rather smart for a self-respecting Briton to have uh, a good Roman name, but others would take a native name, a Celtic name, and we have instances of these with the name Dumnogenos and Nudos and so on. So a nice blend of the Celtic and the Latin in this particular inscription and so on. And also they are proud of their rank. They are illustrious princes and so on. And of course they are Christian. They are using Christian uh, memorials for this monument in this remote spot of the southern uplands of Scotland. So, um, now somebody better tell me how the time is going. Hello? Hello? Hi, you've done four, you've just done under 40 minutes, so we've right. got a bit of time. Uh, well, yes, well, I suppose just to finish off then, a coda. Um, Arthur is a buzz word. People love Arthur. All over the world, if you mention Arthur, people will uh, start listening to you, as I've found myself rather belatedly in my career as a professional philologist and historian. I wish I knew this when I was 21, but one learns with life. And so I'd like to say to everybody who has had the kindness to listen in, first of all, what I present to you as proofs, I say again, I think that anybody could have come to the same conclusions using the various books which I have mentioned in this talk. And I would also like people to think with some confidence that in spite of what is said by some, Arthur really, really existed. He is part of history. We can know a lot about him, that he was killed in the year 537, he died a soldier's death, that he was a North Briton, that he was not a king, but he was an exceedingly uh, resourceful and successful warrior until his final battle. He was a Christian, he would have spoken Latin and British, um, really quite a dossier of information about him. And so, if those listening see in, let's say, a popular newspaper, uh, some of the rather strange stories that come up at regular intervals that somebody has located Arthur at Tintagel or somewhere in uh, southern England or somewhere in Lancashire, whatever, you know, sensational new discoveries on Arthur. Well, listen to these people, uh, obviously, politely and so on. But I feel very sure indeed that we can be certain on what I've put to you so far. The real Arthur existed. He was a brave and resourceful Briton, a hero to his people, and, if I may say so, not only part of the greatest story that the Celtic peoples have given to the world, but also the most famous person ever to come out of what is now the land of Scotland. Fabulous, fabulous. Um, I can't see you, oh, there you are. <laughs> right. um, Thank you very much for that talk. It was extremely interesting um, and it sparked a very lively debate on Zoom chat. I've been trying yes. to keep up with, <laughs> with what people were asking. Um, a lot of people, uh, Jane Williams raised the point, surely Dux Ballorum was a Roman title, not a Welsh one. And that sparked a very lively debate about its origins. So I don't know if you'd like to add anything. Yes, uh, I, published, I published a long paper on this uh, in a French language uh, journal, journal Journal des Langues et de Littérature. So I have looked at this in print. So if anybody wants to see, um, you know, chapter and verse, then I can provide them with a long text. And my view is Dux Bellorum is a rather clumsy Latin translation of what is represented by the Welsh phrase pentaili. Uh, taili in modern Welsh means family, but it derives from British um, tegos lugos, the host of the household, the royal household. And we know quite a lot about the pentaili 
from medieval Welsh law. We know where he sat at banquets. Uh, we know what uh, spoils were given to him after battles. Uh, mm -hmm. We know what his uh, ration was for um, uh, foodstuffs, for meat, and all the rest of it. And I think that the information on the Pentaile from medieval Welsh law uh, gives us certain information on what the Dux Bellorum was. And people who make out, this was something that Collingwood did in his volume, Roman Britain and the English Settlements, which he did with Myers and so on. Um, he converted Dux Bellorum into a fully Roman title. He said Arthur was the last of the Romans, that he was a cavalry chieftain. Well, I remember Kenneth Jackson poured some very cold water on what he uh, described as a somewhat imaginative interpretation of this phrase. I feel it's a medieval Latinization of a Celtic title, title and can be understood in the context of Celtic warfare. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we've also had several questions that I think overlap. Um, someone asked if Arthur was fighting his neighbours, why yes. would he be such a hero? Um, in well, he wasn't a hero stories. to them. <laughs> he certainly wasn't a hero to them. He was a yeah. very dirty word to them. <laughs> uh, indeed, this explains some things I haven't mentioned because there is a notorious reference in the series of elegies called uh, the Godothin. Uh, amongst the very earliest Welsh poetry attributed to Anairin. Um, and there's this obscure single reference to a warrior who fought bravely, who glutted black ravens upon the wall, Cid Nervai Arthur, even though he was not Arthur. And this has been, this has caused enormous controversy. But my view is that since the poetry of Anairin celebrates the warriors of the Godothin, the British people of what is now Southeast Scotland. And since the poems of Taliesin celebrate Irian Hreged, who was the, um, the ruler of a kingdom in what is now Cumbria and so on. Well, since Arthur was from Strathclyde and since he was attacking them, according to my hypothesis, no wonder that their poets didn't want to mention Arthur in their poetry. I mean, they were at the receiving end and so on. And no doubt, and sometimes they gave as good as they got. Um, it is because Strathclyde was the only one of these three British realms to survive uh, the Anglo-Saxon invasion that Celtic traditions were preserved there and eventually moved south, uh, becoming part of the historiography of 9th century Wales in Historia Britonum, and indeed Celtic tradition, Celtic legend as a whole. Okay, and that leads nicely on to a question from Tyler Baxter. And um, the second part of his question is, uh, Nicholas Hyam has recently argued of, about the heavy fictionalization throughout the Historia Britonum. Um, so why should we feel confident that the chapter on Arthur is factual? Yes, well, I know all about this because I had the very book uh, here and so on, uh, kindly presented to me uh, by the author. Uh, incidentally, if, I, suppose, I suppose if we get rid of that inscription and so on, then uh, people, can see, uh, people can see the book which I'm holding up and so on, which I think must be the very book that uh, the questioner is referring to. Well, my view is that, uh, right, here we are. Okay. Here is the, here is the book. Um, I say it is the best book available on Arthur. It is the fullest, it's the most honest. It doesn't simply ignore uh, people that the author disagrees with, which I fear is quite a common complaint with other Celticists and so on. Uh, it gives a very full account of the sources. Uh, it attempts objectivity. Um, my criticism would be that the author is a historian he is not a philologist. He doesn't claim an understanding of the Celtic languages and therefore, I feel, um, does not give due weight to philological arguments for the place names which I've been discussing in this particular lecture. I think that point by point, detail by detail, uh, what he says on the fictional nature of Arthur, I think it can be knocked down uh, without any difficulty whatsoever. Right, wonderful. Uh, sorry, there's a lot of questions that have come in 
in the last few minutes. So I'm just trying to. Um, Gordon Stewart asks, what do you feel about the claim that, is it Gwynion, was the hill fort now called Craig End, just above Stowe in Selkirkshire? Stowe's church was founded by Arthur, so the legend says in the 6th century. And the holy well where the first church was built in thanks after the battle still exists. Ah, well, this is very interesting because, of course, there is plenty of Arthurian folklore uh, and traditions from North Britain. I mean, everybody knows Arthur's seat uh, in, in Edinburgh and so on. And, of course, somebody might say, well, is this consistent with Arthur as a northern hero? And I say, it is, but the trouble is, almost all these place names are very late and so on. I think Arthur's seat is not recorded as such until the, the 16th century, so it's impossible to prove these are early traditions. Well, on the whole question of uh, Carwinley, um, I think if one looks at the records drawn to my attention by Tim Clarkson, I think the, the case for this fort, uh, a rather small one, uh, on a hill to the northeast of Irvine, I think that's pretty strong. Um, and of course, the trouble with Arthur was, if I may say so, he was too successful. And so that this northern hero, you know, people started locating places uh, associated with him in Wales. This happened even in Historia Britonum, um, that in uh, what is now Powys, they pointed out uh, the imprint left by the hoof of his horse and the trace of his hound and so on. That, northern folklore was being industriously relocated in Wales and then later on in Cornwall and basically all over the place. Uh, but I think look at the very earliest sources and they point unmistakably to what is now southern Scotland and the borders. Wonderful. Um, and Warwick Webster has asked, um, if this Arthur was a North of England hero, would we not expect B to have mentioned him as a local lad in his yeah. history? Well, um, uh, you, Arthur and Bede uh, are two different entities. Arthur is a Briton. Bede, these days, I suspect, I'm sorry to say this, but these days I think Bede would be up before the Race Relations Board and stuff. <laughs> he loathed the Britons. I mean, um, in the battle, uh, in that book uh, which I mentioned, my, my book, uh, British Battle, British, let me do a bit of shameless uh, self-advertisement and so on, if I can actually find it. Yes, here it is and so on. Right. Well, I was going to say, it, this is, that stone, nothing to do with Arthur and so on. That, I believe, is uh, on the Upper Tweed as the site of the Battle of uh, Degestan, 603. And it was Athelfrith, king of the North Armands. He slaughtered his Celtic enemies, and Bede thought that was the best thing you could do with them, and so <laughs> And so Bede notoriously glosses over mm -mm. anything which might, you know, cast favourable light upon the Britons. He speaks well of the Irish, and so on, but I'm afraid he was uh, unrepentantly anti-British, and he certainly wasn't in the business of mentioning uh, British heroes of any kind. Uh, in fact, the sort of Britain that he mentions is somebody like um, uh, Cadwachlon, who invaded Northumbria and slaughtered Northumbrians until he himself came to grief up near Hexham and so on, and uh, no uh, bead uh, just regards him as a barbarian and a very, very bad thing. So there is a, a vigorous exchange of opinions on Celtic-English relations in the pages of Bede. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, um, Blackbird has asked, can you explain the etymology of the name Arthur? Is it true yes. that... Yeah, yes, right. There is no doubt about it whatsoever. Kenneth Jackson, in a very good paper published in 1959 in an Oxford uh, collection of essays on the Arthur of the Middle Ages, the Arthurian legend in the, the Middle Ages, edited by R.S. Loomis, he says, Arthur is unmistakably from Latin Artorius and so on. Uh, Artorius, when borrowed by Celtic, it would develop into exactly the sound represented by modern Welsh Arthur and so on. So all these etymologies about it meaning, you know, bear warrior and bear chief and all the rest of it, this is baloney. Like not a few things said about uh, Arthur. Let's, you know, let's not beat about the bush. Kenneth Jackson was a great scholar and he had no doubt whatsoever this is a name of Latin origin. Like Welsh, Tegid, 
for Tacitus, Tacitus, or Dunaud for Latin, for Latin Donatus, and so on. Uh, they go through the, the processes which we can identify. Wonderful. Um, and Oliver Robinson has asked, now excuse my pronunciation, is the place name Argued, Ar Ar sorry, the same as Argoed, mentioned by Tilician in a poem to Urian? Right. The, <laughs> again, yes. Now, just a minute. Uh, okay, let me reach for my copy of Taliesin. Uh, okay, and we can even, we can, which as you see is looking a little bit, uh, it's been around for a long time, like me. Um, I think, is this some, uh, let me look at the list of names at the end. This is, I think, A for Alpha, R for Romeo, oh, Argoid. Oh God, uh, yes, right. sorry, Argoid. I should have spelled it out for you, my pronunciation is terrible. Right. Okay, we, we've got there in the end, right. Uh, Argoid, which is Welsh for besides the wood, uh, next to the wood and so on. Uh, there's Argoid Llwyddain, and this is a title of one of the poems. Uh, Llwyddain has been identified for a very long time with the river Levenet, which I think is to the south of Penrith. Uh, in other words, um, I think all the place names that we can identify in the poetry of Taliesin would locate him not in uh, Galloway or southwest Scotland, um, that uh, Taliesin, that Irian Hreged, um, his, uh, the centre of his kingdom, really seemed to be in what is now East Cumbria. So the people in Penrith who have the Hreged centre and so on, if I may say so, their history is spot on and so Yay. On. <laughs> Yes! yes I, uh, I think good for them. It's, yes, I mean, no one can disagree. Excellent, excellent. I think, I'm sorry, just bear with me. There's a lot of discussion being... Um, okay, there's a bit of Matthew's um, bigging up um, Tintagel, no doubt a royal site. That's more of a comment. Um, ah, somebody's asking about Arthur, son of uh, Ethan, and so on. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Is, yes, um, yes, indeed. This, this is a very important point. Uh, K Professor Ken Dark of the University of Reading published a very good paper on his historical evidence, which I haven't even mentioned, um, which is that in the later 6th century and early 7th century, we start getting princes called Arthur in northern and other genealogies. And a German scholar uh, called Heinrich Zimmer in 1893 said, look, the fact that we're getting people, you know, that Arthur is rather a fashionable name in the late um, 6th century and the early 7th century suggests there had been a hero called Arthur in the recent past. And I think this all holds water. Uh, if there was a real historical warrior called Arthur who died in 537, who was first of all uh, a great warrior and then a legend, no surprise that um, princes should have been named after him in the 560s, the 570s, the 580s. I think if you say, as some people do, I think completely wrongly in my opinion, that Arthur is just a folklore figure like Finn McCool, you know, he never existed and so on. I think it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. Why should the name suddenly be popular in the highest social circles and then, and then die out? Now, somebody I see is telling me, telling us all indeed, that this character died in 590. I think the dates correspond rather neatly. Mm. Yes. Oh. Okay. Can you see that question from Warwick again? <laughs> Something about, about feed something. Um, Ambrosius Aurelianus Ingalls. Oh, Ambrosius Aurelianus. Yeah, uh, Ambrosius Aurelianus. I think there's a very good case for making him out as the victor of uh, Mons Badonicus in 493. Uh, as if I may say so, I discuss in chapter one of that <laughs> book, which um, modesty forbids me from showing to people yet again. It's a little <laughs> there. Uh, a book which I modestly describe as one of the most revolutionary books ever published upon warfare in Britain and so on. Anyway, um, 493, down in the, uh, the area of, of Sirencester, 
the Britons are fighting for very survival and they manage to massacre a West Saxon force attempting to capture Cirencester in the year 493. Um, this place, as I say, by Braden Forest and so on. Nothing to do with Arthur, but of course somebody could have mentioned Gildas, and Gildas, who notoriously does not mention Arthur, but does mention Ambrosius Aurelianus, um, there was a very good article published by a man at University College Cork in Journal of Theological Studies for 2010 um, that um, David Woods showed that Gildas must have been writing in the spring of the year 536 because he mentions a mysterious cloud which covers the whole island of Great Britain and the suggestion is this was the beginnings of the volcano, this was a volcanic cloud but he makes no mention of the terrible famine which followed, which he would have been sure to do um, if he had known of it. And so this clue, which was pointed out by this classicist in Cork, allows us to date not only the uh, great work of Gildas to the year 536, but he says, Baden was fought in the year of his birth 43 years previous, so we can date that to 493, which by the way is the date given to it by Bede, and so on. Bede had a passion for chronology, and on this Wonderful. point he can be vindicated. Wonderful, and that leads me very neatly onto Matt Beamish's question about the volcanic winter. Yeah. Um, that should be identifiable um, in, in any recent cause. Is that, is that research to be published, and has it not been recognised previously? So right. This new research? Right, well what happened was, when I um, started getting the ideas about the battles, I published a paper in uh, Northern History, and there it is, the historical Arthur and 6th century Scotland, and so on. And it, it sets up basically everything that I've been saying this evening. And then, uh, after I'd written it, uh, I think more is by accident, I um, found a reference to a volcanic winter on the web and mm. uh, a reference to it as a reference to a volcanic winter in 536 537 so i published a sequel uh, arthur's battles and the volcanic winter of 536 537 so that two things further saying these battles were fought not for gold not for territory they were fought for food uh, it mm. was a matter of um, what can i say the survival of a, a nation and so on. That is why we have these uh, combats all over uh, what is now southern Scotland, and uh, you know, I think the evidence fits together and so on. So not a chivalrous hero as we think of him from uh, Mallory's Mort D'Arthur and all the rest of it, but uh, a very effective warrior who is bringing food to his people. I think that's what makes the most sense of the various historical records. Wonderful, yeah, and um, thank you to Nicholas, who's just pointed out that the fingerprint layers of the ash have been found in Greenland ice cores, so we do have that evidence to back, to back I'm, that up. I'm very, I'm very happy when archaeologists and other people with scientific know-how can confirm what mere historians like myself are trying to do. You know, I think we can work together and so on. Long may it continue. Absolutely, yes, I'm all for historians and archaeologists working together a lot more. Okay, wonderful. I think the questions have dried up slightly. Um, so I'd just like to point out that this uh, lecture has been recorded and it will appear on the Society's Facebook page sometime next week. Uh, so thank you um, for allowing us to do that. Um, and I would just like to thank you again for a very interesting, stimulating evening. And thank you for bigging up North and West Cumbria. <laughs> uh, so if we can all give him, give you a virtual round of applause for a very, very interesting <laughs> evening. Thank you all very much. You have been a wonderful audience. <laughs>